The scripture reading, our second scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah 56, verses 1 through 8, also from the Inclusive Bible Translation. Happy is the mortal who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it and refrains from doing any evil. Do not let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than my children. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. I am quite a Denzel Washington fan. Any other Denzel Washington fans in the room today? Raise your hand if you like Denzel Washington, <laughs> Pastor Heather. And one of my favorite films of Denzel's, and perhaps it's because it's filmed right here in Pittsburgh, is Fences, the play based on August Wilson's play, The Fences. The main character, Troy, Denzel's character, he struggles in this play, in this film, to know himself and find his place of belonging and acceptance at work, as a husband and as a father, as a brother and a friend, and perhaps primarily as a man of color in the segregated 1950s. The building of the family's backyard fence woven throughout the film seems to symbolize this layered and intersecting struggle of inclusion and exclusion, acceptance and rejection, grace and law, rules and freedom, who's in, who's out, and all the feelings that come with that for him. And at one point in the film, Troy's best friend Bono says to him, some people build fences to keep people out, and other people build fences to keep people in. Perhaps playing off the adage, fences make good neighbors. I don't know if you have a backyard. I don't know what your relationship is with your fence and with your neighbors. But fences do this, right? They create boundaries and barriers and borders. They provide privacy and protection and safety and security. And they also can serve to alienate, seclude, or exclude. How do we, especially in the Church of Jesus Christ, determine who's in and who's out? Who belongs and who does not? Who's excluded and included? And what determines how, when, where, and why we build our fences? I don't need to tell you that we live in a time of extreme fence building to keep people in and people out. Regardless of your political perspective, the space of Gaza is a space of deep, entrenched, historic fences. We live in a time where fear, anxiety, and coercion rule, causing us to build higher walls, stronger borders, longer and taller fences. We do it in our churches, 
in our own backyards. We do it in neighborhoods where the homeless can and cannot sleep. We do it on our national borders, and we do it internationally. And if we're truly honest with ourselves, we do it within our own hearts. Where have you experienced a fence being built to keep you out? If I'm honest in answering that question as a white, middle-class, master's degree, educated, cisgendered male, those circumstances in the place of privilege that I stand are very few stories come to my mind. But I know that's not true for everyone. Not only ask you to reflect on where have you been kept out, but where are you inclined, if you're honest with yourself, to build fences, to keep others out, to keep yourself protected, to keep yourself safe within your own space? And where as a church, either conscious or unconscious, have fences been built to keep some people out or to keep others in and safe? This, these questions and this story and struggle of membership and participation in God's family and the beloved community of God is not an unfamiliar one. In the Hebrew scriptures, to be included in membership of the people of God, you needed to be Jewish, ethnically. And ethically, you needed to uphold the law and the commandments found in the Torah which meant keeping oneself separate from particular people, practices, and places. The list and litany are rather extensive. Just read the entire book of Leviticus. If you're struggling to fall asleep some night, I recommend it. <laughs> and yet, amidst these extensive laws of this is what you have to do to belong, there is this other law that exists woven throughout the Hebrew scriptures. The laws that tended to separate also had a practice within it that we would call, that I would call protective justice on behalf of the people of our world that were vulnerable in a society, who needed protection and care. Specifically, the refrain throughout the Old Testament and specific the prophets, the poor, the widows, orphans, and immigrants. So to belong and to be a member of God's beloved community, one would need to practice purity with justice for the vulnerable, who often ironically fell on the other side of the fences, the boundaries and borders that were established by God's people. We see this in this odd passage from Isaiah today. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, people outside of the community of God. God says, I will give you in my house, within my walls, a monument and a name better than my own children. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners, non-ethnic Jewish people, who will join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. All these images of an outsider, a eunuch, an outsider, a foreigner, brought into the very presence and space of God's own house. Last night I was sharing some thoughts with my wife after dinner on my sermon. She said, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm talking about eunuchs. And she was like, oh, exciting. What's a eunuch? And I, and I said, you don't know what a eunuch is? She said, I mean, I kind of do, but she said, you maybe should tell everyone what a eunuch is. Well, according to theologian Jack Rogers from San Francisco Theological Seminary, a eunuch is simply a biblical word for people who are incapable of procreating or choose not to do so because they have 
no sexual desire for people of the opposite sex. In biblical times and in this era, as Jesus testifies to in Matthew 19, one could either be made a eunuch, and I will spare you the details of that process, <laughs> or born a eunuch. Born a eunuch. And God in this passage in Isaiah says to these people who have been excluded, God says essentially, whether you were made a eunuch or born a eunuch, or as we may say today, an intersex or transgender person, don't worry, I am giving you a place. In fact, I've already given you a place. God doesn't say to the eunuch, I'm going to heal you or change you or make you into these categories of better or best, male or female. God says, I'm going to give you something better than sons and daughters. I'm, get, I'm going to bless you in a way that a Jewish man or a Jewish woman could never imagine being blessed. I'm going to give you an everlasting name as you are. As theologian Megan DeFranza puts it, however these people came to be eunuchs in this time and place in history, God is blessing them as they are, not requiring them to become something they are not. This theme and story carries us into the New Testament that B read for us this morning from the book of Acts. Philip is led to an Ethiopian eunuch, reading from Isaiah, ironically, just three chapters from the chapter I just read. Perhaps in my imagination, I imagine him asking the question, do I belong? Is it possible for me to belong? This person, who is this person that is being written about here that has suffered for the, on behalf of humanity? Wondering if as a eunuch, as a dark-skinned person, outside the fences of God's community if they could be welcomed and fully included into the beloved community of God. And Philip shows no concern, not one, about the eunuch's gender, identity, sexual orientation, race, or ethnicity, and welcomes them into the church through baptism. Philip, if you will, moves the fence posts that God had established, and yet Isaiah had prophesied that would, in fact, be moved. Friends, one of the first conversion stories in the early church that is told to us was a triple outsider, a gender variant foreigner from a racial minority community, and worked for the empire. They are welcomed into God's house, given a name that is better than God's other children, an everlasting name, and they join God's joyful house of prayer for all people. Amen? Amen. Philip is literally a saint. I know as Presbyterians we don't acknowledge saints, but Philip's feast day on the Episcopal Church calendar is October 11th is also National Coming Out Day. Philip could be considered a patron saint of all LGBTQIA plus allies. Friends, the story of God's people has always been a story of ever widening and embrace where rejection and exclusion are transformed into welcome and inclusion. God is always gathering those perceived by us as outcasts, always gathering more than are currently gathered, God almost seems to enjoy <laughs> breaking God's already established boundary lines and moving God's own fence posts, inviting God's people to constantly and continually do the same. So I ask you again, where, when you're honest with yourself, are you inclined to put up a fence? to exclude someone or protect yourself from someone you fear? And how might this vision of radical inclusion be inviting you to move your own internal or external fence posts? Let me close with this other curious part of this passage. Why does Isaiah 
connects the inclusion of formerly excluded people with keeping the Sabbath. At that time, those people did not meet the exterior standards for inclusion, but somehow they kept the Sabbath. This to me is strange and remarkable. Keeping Sabbath has always been a distinctive marker of being a part of God's family and participating in God's community. From the very start in the creation story in Genesis, God invites human beings made in the image and likeness of God's very own self to rest with God by keeping the Sabbath. God, the creator of all things, invites us as human beings into a day of shared and intimate rest. Humans are not just God's minions and servants on earth, but we are co-creators, friends invited into God's abode, that is, into God's very rest. This creation story in the book of Genesis was written in stark contrast to many other creation stories written at that time. At that time, creation stories were written, and the gods are always distant, creating the world with violence, creating humans simply to do the gods' bidding as indentured servants while the gods simply relax and enjoy a vacation. That was me eating grapes. <laughs> but not this God. We, as God's creatures, are invited and welcomed into the intimate rest of God's own house. God's own presence. Practicing Sabbath is part of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And we show to the rest of the world that we are made in the image and likeness of God by resting. Can I get an amen on that? Keeping Sabbath is part of what it means for us to be the children of God, no matter your gender, birthplace, ethnicity, economic standing, sexual orientation, or physical capabilities. This, I believe, is what Isaiah is rightly pointing to in these eunuchs and foreigners. And he says, look, these people are not outside the fence of God's family and love. In fact, they're demonstrating their belonging. They're demonstrating that they know God by honoring the Sabbath and receiving God's invitation to be with me, to dwell in the intimate boat of rest and restoration. In the words of Walter Brueggemann, Sabbath for us represents a radical disengagement from the producer-consumer rat race of the empire. The community welcomes members of any race or nation, any gender identity or social condition, so long as that person is defined by justice, mercy, compassion, and not competition, achievement, production, or acquisition. These foreigners, these eunuchs, these Sabbath keepers, these persons of faith who refuse to be defined by cultural expectations are admitted and welcomed into the family of God. Friends, Sabbath keeping deconstructs the notion of being qualified for membership into God's family. Sabbath is pure gift offered freely by God but to invite anyone to come and dwell in God's restful abode. Author Pete Scazzaro says, God has built into the very fabric of creation 52 snow days a year. <laughs> and somehow these outsiders were able to dial in to the fabric of creation and keep Sabbath, and God says, they, perhaps even more than those of you on the inside, you rule followers, belong to the community of God. God never stops gathering people until everyone is gathered. The story of God's people in our sacred scriptures and the history of the church, yes, checkered with exceptions, and in each of our lives is a marvelous transformation of moving from not being a people to being God's people. 
from being excluded to being included, from rejection to belonging. Our story is the story of an ever-broadening inclusion, inviting all people to receive the gift of Sabbath rest of God. I hope you hear that invitation this morning. I hope you will extend that invitation to others this morning. Siblings at ELPC, and in particular, my LGBTQIA siblings, you have been the presence and reflection of God to me. This story that I have told this morning has not always been my story. And I want to take a moment of privilege to say thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for letting the brilliant and beautiful light of Christ shine in you and shine through you. Thanking, thank you for making a place at the table for me. Thank you for bearing God's image to me and showing me the love, the light, the freedom, and the beauty of God's ever-widening, ever-growing, ever-expanding embrace and inclusion of all of God's children. This church and you, my LGBTQIA plus siblings, have been a huge blessing to me. So as we continue to walk and journey as a church, in this time of transition, I hope and I pray that we will continue to receive the invitation of God to keep moving our own fence posts, recognizing that God has already included those who are hard for us to include, and that it is perhaps them, somehow, who mysteriously invite us to be gathered into the fold of God. May we have the grace and the patience and the courage and the perseverance to continue to become God's house of prayer for all people. And may we experience God's joy on this journey. May it be so. Amen.